All right, this class is uh, Isaiah for Beginners. Uh, we're at uh, lesson number two, entitled Structures and Features, part one. That's an interesting title, Structures and Features uh, in, in studying a Bible book, but you'll understand that unless you, under, unless you really understand how Isaiah wrote this book, how he put it together, is very difficult to understand the message that's in the book. So that's why we're spending a couple of lessons uh, figuring out how he put, you know, structurally, how he put this book together. Uh, and then as we go on, uh, it'll be much clearer as we uh, continue. Well, so far we have noted that the prophet Isaiah lived in Jerusalem between the eighth and seventh century before Christ. Uh, we said that he was a contemporary of several kings and he prophesied during the reigns of Jotham, King, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and of course, King Hezekiah. The main subject of his prophecies were warnings, uh, warnings uh, to the rulers, both of the Northern Kingdom, Israel, and also warnings to the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah concerning their conduct and their faithfulness to God and various relationships that they had with foreign, uh, with foreign powers. Uh, some of the prophecies, for example, he would uh, denounce uh, the king's alliances with pagan nations to secure military protection instead of trusting God for their safety. In other words, you know, if they were in trouble, if they were being attacked, they would make you know, a treaty with another country uh, and purchase some of their uh, military strength to come in and help them fight against a, a third party. And Isaiah often uh, denounced kings for doing that, uh, saying to them, you're the people of God, you ought to be trusting God to, to save you and not trusting other nations, especially pagan nations. Uh, to, uh, to help you. Also, uh, there were warnings of impending attacks and destruction coming. Uh, he denounced uh, surrounding nations for their worship of pagan gods. And he uh, also announced judgment on them. So he didn't just uh, warn and, 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 and uh, tell uh, the kings of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom that trouble was coming, that judgment was coming. He also warned other nations in the surrounding nations that they too would be judged and punished for their conduct. He also predicted the restoration of the Southern Kingdom after their defeat and their exile. Uh, and then of course, a uh, very important part of uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah uh, articulated the form the method and the result of God's promised salvation in the future. Of all the prophets, he's the one that most clearly explained exactly what God was going to do in order to save the nation and actually save the world. He said that the form of salvation would be a man and not an army and not a politic or not a philosophy, but the form of God's salvation would come in the form of a, of a man. The method he even explains would be vicarious atonement, meaning uh, someone would suffer the punishment for someone else's uh, sins, vicarious atonement. And the results of uh, the salvation would be the regeneration of mankind. And so of all the prophets, he's the one that most clearly defined uh, what the salvation uh, that God would send uh, would be like. And so these prophecies were not only given once, but they were repeated at different times using various words and literary devices. That's why it's helpful for us to understand the form and the structure of his writing, because he often repeats the same thing, but he repeats it in different ways, okay? Uh, in this lesson, we're going to begin to examine the way that Isaiah wrote and how he put his book together. Understanding this, of course, will help us understand what exactly the prophet was trying to communicate to the people of that time. 
So let's talk about the, the structure of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecies and his teachings are presented uh, using five main topics. Five topics or five themes, if you wish, throughout the book. These consist of the five uh, following uh, themes. One is the messianic hope. Two, the motif of the city, the city being Jerusalem. Uh, the third theme is the Holy One of Israel. The fourth uh, is the faith response of the Jews throughout history. And then the fifth is uh, a special literary and structural features of Isaiah's writings. In other words, the way that he writes reveals the meaning of uh, what he is trying to get across. And that in itself is a, a kind of a theme in the book. Now the book would be a lot easier to understand and follow if Isaiah had taken each of these topics or themes or devices and had written you know, a chapter or two about each one in successive order, as we would do in Western culture. You know, the main theme, let's say uh, the Messianic hope, chapter one, Roman numeral number one, Messianic hope. Uh, blah, 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 A, sub, subtitle A, some subtitle B, C, you know, and so on and so forth. That'd be great, two, three chapters of that. And then, whoa, chapter four, uh, motif of the city, Roman numeral one, let us tell you about that, and so on and so forth. That's the way we happen to write about various subjects. But Isaiah uh, wrote uh, with an Eastern mindset, of a Jewish prophet and a poet. I mean, most of his book is poetry. And so it's not as easy to, you know, to decipher as uh, it would be if it was written in a you know, Western theme. So his five topics or themes, therefore, are seen as five individual strands that are carefully and artfully braided together, each repeatedly overlapping the other to tell a single story. Uh, think of braiding hair. Uh, you know, I remember when our girls were young, had long hair, you know, mom would take one, two, three strands, you know, and she would braid them together into one. Well, it's kind of what Isaiah is doing with his five themes. Each one of these is a strand. And what he does is that he braids them all together. They overlap and intertwine each other Okay, and tell the, it tells the same story. And if you're not aware of what the five themes are, you're going to be reading and then all of a sudden he switches over to something else. You know, he's talking about the Messianic hope and then all of a sudden he starts talking about the city of Jerusalem. You know, and you're, you're saying, well, well, wait a minute, what happened to the Messianic hope? Uh, and then he'll switch over and talk about the Holy One of Israel. And so if we understand that there are five themes here and they are, they are being written about co concurrently, then it helps us to understand where we are in the book while we're reading book. So in other words, you understand many times some of the words, but you can't follow the storyline in order to understand the message unless uh, you, know, you know ahead of time these five uh, these five um, uh, strands. Uh, so knowing the, the themes and the features of the writing helps the reader know who and what the prophet is talking about in different parts of the book. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine these five strands here, okay, before we actually even look uh, at the book. The first strand is the, uh, the messianic hope. The messianic hope, let's get that up there. Now the Jews from the time of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, the Jews had been promised a savior, but until Isaiah came, the form and the purpose of this Messiah had not yet been clearly defined. Yes, there was a Messiah, yes, there was a savior, and yes, it was coming in the future, but just exactly who this Messiah was or what it was and what would exactly happen, you know, uh, it wasn't so clear uh, to, to, uh, to the people. Now we, uh, we have references to him, the Messiah, uh, 
or the Savior in the book of Job, for example, in Job chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. And we have references to, to the Messiah in, in the Psalms, Psalm 110, verse one. But Isaiah is the prophet that most clearly defined him along with the way that he was to save the people. This is why Isaiah is called the prince of the prophets because he's the one that articulated most clearly the work and the person and the, uh, you know, and the results of, of the Messiah. Now Isaiah provides us with three portraits of the messianic hope in this strand, the messianic hope in this strand. And so he writes about the Messiah as a king, chapters one to 37. And then he writes about the Messiah as a servant in chapters 38 to 55. And then he talks about the Messiah as an anointed conqueror in chapters 56 to 66. So he's always talking about the Messiah but in one part of the book, he's talking about him as a king. In another part, he's talking about the same Messiah, but as a servant. And then he talks about him as an anointed conqueror, okay? Although separate and distinct as portraits, all three share similar features, indicating that they are all meant to be facets of a single messianic personage. So the king, the servant, the anointed conqueror, they're all the same person. For example, let's say you name three animals, uh, a lion and a bear and an eagle. However, in describing each one, you use words like fierce and powerful and cunning. Well, all things that are true about each creature and serve to unify them rather than to distinguish them. In other words, they're all cunning. They're all powerful. You, know, you, you, know, you, you can be describing any one of these three animals with these adjectives. Well, this is what Isaiah does very, very much in describing the messianic hope. Describes him as king, describes him as servant, describes him as anointed conqueror, all things that are true about this single uh, individual. So in Isaiah's description of the messianic hope as a king or as a servant or as a conqueror, each one of these has similar traits. The king, the servant, and the conqueror all have these traits. First, each is endowed with the spirit and the word of God. So we read, for example, in Isaiah 59, uh, 21, it says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit, which is upon you and my words, which I have put into your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, for now and forever. So each of these individuals, the king, the Messiah as servant, the Messiah as conqueror, each would be filled with the spirit and the word. Okay, you following along? Each, another example, each would be filled with righteousness as a natural state. In 53 verse nine, he says, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And so the king, the servant, the conqueror, all of them were righteous, okay? Shared righteousness. Another thing that he says about the messianic hope, the messianic hope would be a servant or a descendant of David. The king, the servant, the conqueror were each seen as descendants of David, fulfilling promises made through him. In Isaiah uh, chapter nine, verse six and seven, he says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end uh, to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. 
And so all three, the king, the servant, the conqueror, each of these will be descendants of David. Another example of this. Uh, each will bring the messianic hope in each of its forms, both to Jews and to Gentiles. And so in Isaiah two, he writes, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it'll come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his path. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so here, the king, the servant, the conqueror, all three of them, will provide salvation, not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, all right? All, all, all will be subject to the salvation brought uh, uh, by the uh, messianic, uh, messianic hope. Uh, another feature, each of these, king, servant, and conqueror, will have a dual nature or will be described in, in, as having a dual nature, both God and a man. For example, the king would be born in David's line, chapter 11, verse one. Uh, in other words, as a man, uh, he would be a root from which David himself springs, chapter 11, verse 10. However, this king will be called mighty God. And so the, the king, you know, the messianic hope as king will be both God and man will have both of those features. Um, the servant uh, has human uh, ancestry. Isaiah chapter 53, verse two, it says, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no steady form or stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. So here Isaiah is talking about a man and, and not a man that that is uh, uh, beautiful or anything, just a very ordinary man. But then he also said, also is the Lord himself bringing salvation. And so uh, when he talks about uh, the servant, he talks about the servant in human terms, but also in uh, uh, divine terms uh, uh, as well. Uh, he was the Lord uh, bringing the salvation in the form of a servant. And then the anointed conqueror, uh, again, the God-man combination as savior in, uh, let's see, uh, 59. Okay, so in verse 59, it says, now the Lord saw and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought, so there's the conquering, okay. There's the conqueror there. Then his own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Who's this sound like? Does this, does this not sound like uh, uh, Paul's writing in Ephesians? You wonder, where did Paul get that idea? Anyways, he keeps going. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle according to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands, he will make uh, a recompense. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the ring of the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. A redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. So there's the personage of the appointed conqueror, the God-man combination as the appointed conqueror. In other words, the appointed conqueror will be both God and man, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, the point I'm making here is that this first strand, the messianic hope, uh, uh, Isaiah, through the power of the spirit, creates three portraits of the coming Messiah, with each portrait providing particular information 
about this uh, individual. Uh, he'll talk about this individual uh, as a, a person having a royal position of authority as a king. And then he'll talk about this you know, messianic hope uh, in his human character as a man with a mission, the servant. And then he's going to talk about this messianic hope as the anointed conqueror with ultimate victory over death as the anointed conqueror uh, coming from God. Okay. And that's just one strand. Just, you know, I said there's five strands. <laughs> so that's just the first strand, the messianic hope. That's subdivided into three different characters that he talks about at different times. And sometimes he's talking about the king and then he'll talk about something completely different. And you have to understand, you have to keep in mind uh, that he's always talking about the messianic hope when he's talking about the king or the servant or the anointed, uh, the anointed conqueror. So this uh, unified vision that the prophet Isaiah presents is that of a person who is a descendant of David, full of the spirit and word of God, and fully righteous, who will ultimately succeed in bringing salvation to both Jews and Gentiles. So this is you know, the beginning of his articulation of who the uh, Messiah is going to be. In other words, this king and conqueror will do this because he is the chosen servant sent by God. Okay. Now the next topic or strand that Isaiah addresses is referred to as the motif. The motif or the pattern or the concept of the city. And of course the city is Jerusalem. Some of the passages that I read uh, concerning the messianic hope, he talks about the mount and the mountain and Zion. That's this second strand here. He's talking about Jerusalem. You know, the servant or the king is going to come to Jerusalem to do his work, okay? Uh, the problem is that he refers to Jerusalem in a lot of different ways. We'll talk about that in a second. So in the writings of Isaiah, the city of Jerusalem plays an important part in the outworking of God's plan. A little bit of history. The city is first introduced in Genesis 1418 through Melchizedek, who was described as the king of Salem, later to become Jerusalem. Okay, you wonder, he's the king of Salem. Salem is Jerusalem, okay? And his royal priesthood was recognized by Abraham, who paid tithes to this priestly king. He was both a priest and a king. If you notice in the Jewish, among the Jewish people, the, uh, the priests could not be kings and the kings were not allowed to be priests. Remember Saul uh, he lost the kingdom, why? Because he was impatient. Uh, he didn't wait for Samuel to come and to offer the sacrifice to do the duty of the priest. And so he just ran ahead and he did the sacrifice himself and because of that, he lost the kingdom. The king was not allowed to be a priest and a priest was not allowed to be a king. And yet we uh, learn of this Melchizedek, they mention him in Genesis, and they refer to him as both priest and king. And then we find out why this is so. It's because Melchizedek is the pattern for the Messiah, who would also be a priest and a king at the same time, patterned not after Jewish priests, you know, like, like Aaron, but patterned after Melchizedek, who was a, uh, both a king and a, a priest. And so David uh, captured this ancient city uh, and made it the capital as well as the political and religious center of his kingdom since the temple and the royal palace were both eventually located there. The significance of uh, the city in Isaiah. Uh, 
Well, Isaiah uh, uses Jerusalem as the, a character and a metaphor for the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. Uh, this is first mentioned in Isaiah chapter one, verse one. If you're not sure, a metaphor, uh, if you remember from your grammar classes, is a word used to symbolize something else, okay? A word used to symbolize something else. So in this case, the word Jerusalem, which is the name of the city, uh, Isaiah uses that word to symbolize the people, the nation. Of, of, of Israel or the people, the Jewish people themselves, okay? So he uses the city as a metaphor for God's people all over the world, not just cultural Jews, uh, uh, those living in Jerusalem or living in the country of Israel. Uh, a little bit like, uh, if you remember after 9-11, uh, you know, the terrorist attack on New York City, after 9-11, people around the world said, we are New York, you know, as a way of solidarity. They would, people in Paris said, we are New York. There were signs as a demonstration of solidarity and sympathy with the city of New York that had, you know, had this terrible tragedy take place. Well, in this sense, all Christians can say, we are Jerusalem, expressing the idea that we are God's people, right? So this was Isaiah's use of the city of Jerusalem metaphor. He also uses it to express the notion that what happened to the city also happened to the people, uh, also happened to the nation, as well as the spiritual nation uh, itself. And so Isaiah uses four interchangeable terms when he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. The first, well, is Jerusalem itself. The second is Zion. When he talks about Zion, he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. Zion is just another word for Jerusalem. Um, the original word, uh, the original root word from which the word Zion comes from means a holy place, a holy place, okay? So Zion also uh, is a word referring to Jerusalem. When he says the holy mount or the holy mountain, he's talking about Jerusalem. And then the city, when he just mentions the city, he's, there's, he's not talking about Samaria, he's not talking about Damascus or Bethlehem. You know, when he says the city, he's talking about Jerusalem. And remember, Jerusalem is a metaphor for the Jewish people. So Zion, is a metaphor for the Jewish people. Um, the mount or the mountain, a metaphor for the Jewish people. Okay, so you've got you know, different words that mean the same thing that also is used as a, a metaphor. Now he writes various themes with the city as the central object or figure. For example, he talks about the divine judgment on the city or the preservation or the restoration of the city, or the security of the city, uh, the security one that uh, has who dwells in the city, or the security, uh, excuse me, or the centrality of the city in God's thought and, and, and plans, or the eschatological vision of the city at the end of time. So Isaiah's view of heaven was that God was seated as king at the center of the city, reigning over the entire universe, filled with righteousness and peace, okay? And remember, when he's talking about the city and all of these things, he's talking about not only the Jewish, the cultural Jewish people, he's talking about the people of God. We are the people of God. We today are the children of Israel. So to summarize, therefore, the city of Jerusalem is used by Isaiah as a metaphor for A, the Jewish nation during his time, B, all of God's people in the world in the future, and C, the fulfillment and the image of God's heavenly kingdom at the end of time. And you only know what he's talking about in context, you know, you have to read the context. 
So in this lesson, we've examined two of the uh, five uh, themes or topics or strands which Isaiah will use to present his prophecies and teachings. One, the messianic hope, and the messianic hope seen as a king, a servant, or an anointed conqueror. And then two, we looked at the second strand, the motif or the pattern of the city. This is where Isaiah explores the history of Jerusalem, the significance of the city representing the people now and in the future, the terms uh, it is referred to by Jerusalem or Zion or Mount or city. He also looks at the city from various angles, the city being judged or the city being restored. And he looks at the city as a metaphor for the present, the near future and end times. And again, you have to, you know, you have to look at the context to know which he's talking about. Is he talking about now? Is he talking about the near future? Or is he talking about the end of the world? Okay, next time we get together, Lord willing, we're going to look at the third and fourth themes or strands that Isaiah uses. The third and fourth strands are the Holy One of Israel and the faith response of the Jewish people throughout history. That's what we're going to be studying next time. So we're going to try to keep all of these balls in the air here. We haven't even opened the book yet, <laughs> but uh, the things that I'll talk about in Isaiah will make a whole lot more sense if we understand you know, this uh, background. So that's our lesson for uh, today. I look forward to uh, doing uh, one more lesson with you next week, lesson number three. We'll see you then. God bless you.